Hey everybody, um, getting ready to, getting pretty close to the point where I'm about to try a test cut on this um, shaper, and uh, I want to talk about the uh, the setup. Right now, I've got the setup uh, the way I've got the cutter oriented. I've decided once again to change my mind and change plans and actually flip the cutter back over the way I first put it on, which I originally thought was not the right way to, to do it. And I'll explain why in a minute. First, let me show you what I was going to do. I uh, was in the city the other day and I stopped at the uh, Habitat for Humanities uh, run store called Restore, which is a great place to get all kinds of different things. And when I was looking around, I spotted this, this uh, board. It's actually, um, it appears to be particle board uh, or some kind of fiber board because this edge is unfinished with a plastic laminate. It feels plastic on it. I think it was part of a cabinet. It's actually got some holes in it. And on this side, there's actually even a, a couple of dowels sticking up. So this is basically was left over from something that either got broken and trashed or who knows what. I did see some kitchen cabinets that were white that were close by to this, so I think this came in with a load of kitchen cabinets. Um, cheap kitchen cabinets. But anyways, this is, um, I figured it would be just a ticket for my auxiliary table that I was going to make. In other words, the plan was going to be to uh, cut this and make a table that sat on top of the cast iron table here. So just a quick refresher on the problem that I was trying to overcome here. All right, this is a, this is a five and a quarter inch diameter cutter. And even if I take this insert out of the cast iron table, that gives me a five inch diameter hole. And so then I, I won't be able to, I would not be able to get the cutter to go down below the surface of the table and come up from the bottom and cut the bottom of the panel uh, on the cut the panel on the bottom side and then just raise it up as I needed to go so my plan was to have the cutter lowered down as low as I could safely have it lowered which is about here and then build up this table height with a piece like this and I would cut a um, half circle here or cut out a section right here for the uh, cutter to have clearance and then that would give me basically this table height here which you can see is almost above the cutter so on the first pass right now it would just take very little but then as I raised it up on each successive pass uh, it would it would take more material off because I, I wanted do this operation several several passes anyways which is what's recommended so that's what I was going to do the reason why I thought that this is how we were supposed to do it is because it made sense to me that as you were routing for lack of a better term the panel that you would want the cutter to be covered by the by the stock so um, that's why I thought this is the way you should do it and it turns out that is the way you would do it if you were using a router bit raised panel cutter in other words uh, like this so because the um, raised panel bit has a shank on it that goes down through the tabletop into the router uh, this is how the cutter would normally be so it's sort of like what I was trying to do here where the cutter is facing up and I would actually be routing the uh, panel and the back of the raised panel would be facing up, not the actual face that was being cut. Well, turns out that on shaper cutters like this, all of the videos and photos that I've seen online have shown that shaper cutters are actually supposed to be the other way around. In other words, this should be flipped over, that the face that's actually being cut should be facing up so that you can actually see the finished cut 
or the, the finished area, the cut area as it's coming out, and that you would actually start with the cutter raised up higher, and on successive passes, you would lower the cutter down a little more each time to take more material off. So this is how I now believe that it's supposed to be mounted. So I've got this all tightened down. Um, I've got the cutter raised up all the way uh, as far as I can raise it. I can actually raise it a little bit more, but then the cutter actually starts to impinge on this uh, area here of the guard because I, I milled out that little relief there, but I didn't make it all the way up the side because I didn't really think I was going to be doing this this way. Um, but I'm going to actually be able to rectify that in a second by moving the fence back because now by putting the cutter this way, the other thing that lets me do is that lets me actually bring the fence further back that way so that the width of the cut will be wider. Which also, um, when you think about it, you want that little lip that normally on a raised panel would go into the rail or the style. Um, the groove on the rail or the style. In my application, I do still want that lip there, but I don't need that lip to be back cut. So that's why I don't have to worry about having a, a back cutter blade stacked underneath this to do that operation for me at the same time. So I, I don't know all the terminology, but I think that's what it's called, a back cutter. And I think it'll become more... Uh, clear what I'm talking about once I get one of these panels uh, actually done hopefully but what I want to do is if I put a straight edge across here this is an older plate I had handy it's nice and straight if I put a straight edge across here across the two I'm actually not touching I'm pretty far away from this um, bushing that's underneath here so I can actually get in a little closer to that. So I'm going to uh, loosen the bolts here and move the fence back a little bit more. All right, so I moved, I, I took my plate here and I've just got it up against this fence. And I moved this fence back until this plate is almost touching that bushing underneath there. I don't want it touching it because that bushing is not a bearing, so it can't roll across it. Um, it's going to have a tendency as this is spinning to want to uh, to want to rub on that uh, edge of the panel, and I don't want that happening. So I'm going to leave that tiny space in there. So now, if I bring this plate across, I can see that I need to bring this fence back. So I picked up about an eighth of an inch. So it really didn't make much of a difference, I don't think. Alright, so now because I moved this back, I've got to adjust the wood fence that way just a little bit because it's just, the cutter tip is just hitting the fence right there. Alright, so next I want to determine cutter rotation and I want to determine the direction of feed. Now, the direction of feed, as illustrated in this very crude little drawing that comes in the... Uh, lousy manual it shows the feed is in this direction it shows the rotation of the cutter is in this direction so what they're basically showing you is that you feed into the cutter opposite the direction that the cutter is cutting which would make sense because if you were feeding with the direction if, if the cutter was rotating this way and you were feeding in this way the cutter would have a tendency to want to continue to pull the stock in which is not what you want um, the danger, of course, is feeding in this direction. It, it, again, same example, cutter rotating in this direction. Feeding against the cutter is the cutter could grab the piece and have a tendency to want to throw the piece out this way and make it a projectile, especially if it's a small piece. So we'll have to be careful about that. That's why on big shapers, usually they have an auto feeder, which is basically... Um, almost like a, a set of wheels, friction wheels, that push down on the board and give downward pressure, 
and actually drive the board through at a very steady feed rate, which also improves the finish, I'm sure. And as far as direction of rotation of this cutter, it's pretty pretty clear cut. We can see from this little carbide tip on the end here that obviously this has to be counterclockwise rotation. So I'm just going to pulse this quickly. So that is clockwise rotation. We want counterclockwise, which is this. So that's when I put it in the forward position. I still have it on this rolling uh, rolling base. I'm going to take it off the base and get it onto the cement floor and that should uh, get some of that vibration out of there. Alright, so these bars right here are for the uh, hold downs and uh, the way these work is there's actually two sets of them. Normally you would put these right here, this part facing down to the table and then you would mount another one of these clamps with another one of these spring bars like this and what that would do is that would that would actually put side tension spring tension on the board to keep it up against the fence that would be if you were routing a narrow board but because I'm routing the panels that are going to be out here I've got to actually keep these tilted up out of the way so I'm only going to use these hold downs here so I'm just going to temporarily put these in position. So I couldn't get a scrap of the uh, MDF material that I want to use for my project. So the best I could do was buy this pre-cut 24 inch square panel that they sell at uh, the Home Depot. And uh, by doing that, I've got of some material that's the same type of material and the same thickness of what I want to eventually use for panels to uh, basically run a test run. So I'm just putting this on here to get an idea of roughly the thickness of the material. And I'm going to now just tweak that ever so slightly. What that should do is that should give me spring tension, downward tension on those, uh, on that panel as I'm pushing it through. I'm not too concerned with it wanting to lift up because it's going to be going under the cutter after all. all right, hopefully this will be a good angle for the camera shot. I'm going to um, be wearing a full face shield. And hearing protection because this is probably going to be loud as hell. calculation on my part. I forgot about all the warnings about how dusty it is working with MDF. So I'm wearing a dust mask right now because the shop has a cloud of very fine dust. And I mean it is really fine stuff. <laughs> so my plan is to put an attachment on here and run the, 
the vac during the process and I thought maybe for cutting just one side I could get away with not having to hook up the vac. Um, that was obviously wrong. I might move this whole operation outside. There's like hardly anything on the floor of this. It all went this way. Makes sense. The cutter's cutting this way. It's throwing it that way. But I mean, I could see a film of the dust on the floor 10, 12 feet away from where I'm standing. So, uh, the spindle didn't snap. The, the cutter didn't explode into a million pieces of shrapnel and tear my body to shreds. Um, so, uh, it can be done. Would I advise doing it? Absolutely not. So uh, that's one pass. And the uh, Shaper horsepower um, routing this MDF did not seem to be an issue at all. Uh, I was too busy kind of concentrating on the task at hand to really pay attention. But I don't know about you guys, but I don't really hear any uh, depreciable uh, reduction in RPM as it was doing the work. Seemed like it went right through that nicely. And that profile right there is, is pretty close already to where I want to be. So I think I'm going to probably try around, you know, try and take another pass. See, this is getting pretty thin here, though. That actually might be. So it turns out I think I'm going to be able to actually cut these in one pass. Because I think I'm, I might, I might leave it right there. The only thing I don't like is there's an, I don't know if it's showing up on the camera or not. There's a line right here. That's actually a scratch line from the uh, the hold downs. So those hold downs have rust on them still. I got to clean them up. I kind of was in a rush tonight. I wanted to show that I could get this. I want to show show basically myself, prove to myself that this was going to work. So anyways, um, I'm going to start playing around with some molding ideas on how I'm going to trim this out. Because this is not, again, this is not going to be a door panel with a traditional rail and style setup. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a wainscoting thing that I'm playing with. And it's not my own idea. Actually, I, I got it out of uh, like professional woodworking magazine or something like that years ago. And I took a photocopy of that project idea and I put it in my file cabinet. And when I started building my house, I said, that's what I want to do. I said, I think that is a really cool idea. And basically it's, it's an idea where you make raised panel wainscoting. You, make, you end up with the look of a true raised panel wainscoting without going through making very intricate large rails and styles so what ends up happening is uh, well I'll, I'll, I'll show some of that when I get to the point where I start putting it up but uh, I think I'm gonna call it a night